Well, welcome my fellow New Zealanders. I always like to try and understand the audience that I'm addressing. Can I just get a show of hands who had heard of Ray Avery before this event? Just put your hand up your head. So we're talking 89.725%. <laughs> Must try harder. Being slightly famous is very complicated. You know, you don't know if people know you or not when you're just communicating, going around your normal business. When I was knighted, the day that I was knighted, it was announced in the New Year's Honours List in the Herald, and I was at Bunnings Warehouse, because my father-in-law was over from Sydney and we were building a deck together, so we had concrete under each arm walking out of Bunnings. And this builder came towards me and he went, good on you, sir, eh? And that only happens in New Zealand land, you know. And then I got to the checkout counter and the checkout check did all the calculation, and then finally she said, Thank you, sir. Does she know? Because <laughs> you don't know, you know. Uh, I'm going to talk about innovation, but I want you to take home some key messages about how you can improve your life as well. And how certainly you can make uh, observation the key to innovation and, and be a constructive person in society and do things that are really, really clever. We're all capable of doing it, but you need a few tools. So. If I can just do a little scientific experiment, if I can get you on the count of three, I want you, because you're all different, you're all special, you've all got a personal voice, but somebody in this audience has got a much bigger voice than anybody else, right? So what I want you to do on the count of three, I want you to shout out your first name, your Christian name, okay? So Ben or Sally, just shout it out. One, two, three. That's bloody rubbish. Um, somebody give me a voice, right? One, two, three. That's rubbish. So, <laughs> let's try something else. Just shout out my name, which is Ray. So on three, count up my name. One, two, three. Ray! Brilliant. See what we can do with a plan. If you've got a plan and you're all working together, you can do things. But unfortunately, what happens in organisations is that they get fragmented often. You know, the larger the organisation, the more likely it is to get fragmented. So you end up with production, quality assurance, and they hate each other. Pretty much everybody has accounts. And you get, you get all this distorted stuff going on. The thing that, the key that I learned was, the, the, the people that you work with, you spend more waking hours with them in a lucid way than you do your family. So why not make them your family? Because when you do that, you build teams that believe they can do anything. And that's what we do at Medicine Mondial. On our business cards on the back, it's got Change the World. Because everybody involved in what we do believes they can. And you know, those people that are crazy enough to believe they can change the world are the ones that do. So the first thing is to remember is that there's nobody in this room, there's not one single person that's as clever as all of us. So you need to build teams of people and take them on a journey, have a dream, and then help them to build the infrastructure for you to be able to do those things. Now the other thing you need to do, of course, is so you've got a team, and you've got a plan. The other thing about having a plan that I think is pretty fascinating about us as a species is that we're the only species on the planet that know we're going to die to do nothing about it. <laughs> I've got 4,975 days left to live. And I know what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to change the world. You guys have got no idea. You have like there's no tomorrow. If you were building a business up, you'd build that business up and you'd certainly have an exit strategy how you're going to sell the business and make a fortune. In your real life, you do none of that. Your exit strategy is going to be the same as mine. You're going to die. It's going to be a big bloody surprise for most of you. <laughs> so have a plan. What I can tell you, if you've got a plan, you'll be much more successful than your contemporaries who don't have a plan. Because even if you aim for the horizon line and scud and hit, uh, you know, aim for the stars and you hit the horizon line, you're still further ahead than all of your contemporaries. So plan your diet. Don't waste it. Don't have a bucket list, because your bucket list means that you've got your life wrong. Live your life the way that you want to live it. And also, because it is going to be one day the last day of your life. So I'm using my 4,000 odd days to actually make a big difference in the world. And what makes us different in New Zealand is that we've got certain characteristics which allow us to do that on the world stage. Um, but before we get into that, the reality is that most innovations, if not all innovations, occur because of one single thing. And that's the power of observation. All of you are capable of inventing really, really cool stuff just by being alert to the things that are around you. And I'll give you some practical examples. 
um, there was a guy hunting in the Swiss um, forest, and his dog came back to him, and it had all these cockle um, um, plant hairs on its uh, dog, and so they were all hooky things, and they got stuck on. So he took them home, got his child's microscope, looked at them under the microscope, saw all the hooks, and invented Velcro. It's as simple as that. Penicillin was simply invented because somebody looked down a microscope and saw these bacteria didn't grow up against that mould. And all of these inventions are all within your grasp if you just look at things. I'll give you how, uh, an example of how profound that can be. When I came to New Zealand, I saw a Maori guy squeeze some kiwi fruit onto steak. Has anybody done that? Yep, if you do it. Um, it's got a cooking show now. So you squeeze a little bit on one side of the steak, turn it over, squeeze another little bit, leave it in the fridge for about uh, three or four hours. When you cook it, it'll melt in your mouth. Because in kiwi fruit are these enzymes, these actin in it, enzymes. We also saw uh, ladies that were packing kiwi fruit in those days had no fingerprints, because the actinase was actually dissolving their fingerprints. It turns out that in kiwi fruit, it's the most potent proteose enzyme in the world. If you get a chook and put it into a bucket of kiwi fruit for about a week at 40 degrees, when you pull it out, there's no chook. It's like a Boris Karloff movie. Just the bones are left. So I knew that I could use that to fix global protein and energy and nutrition. Kids in developing country get repeated episodes of diarrhea, and then the lining of their stomach gets damaged, and they can't absorb big proteins. The only way you can typically get proteins into them is to inject them with an IV drip uh, with some uh, an intravenous solution of amino acids, and they cost about $80 for a drip. Just doesn't happen in developing countries, so those kids die. So what I came up with was a process where we take waste streams from the abattoirs and we process it with waste streams in the kiwi fruit industry and we can produce these very high-end, low-cost amino acid complexes which we can get to kids in developing countries for 40 cents a sachet. By year 2030, some half a billion children in sub-Sahara Africa will benefit from this technology. It's kiwi technology which we invented. <laughs> And one of the things, you know, with regard to medical issues, um, I would be sitting around in hospitals but watching things. And the other thing that I noticed, which was most common, was a dead baby waiting to be collected by its parents and a dead incubator. Because the neonatal incubators are not designed to work in developing countries. And so we had to fix that problem. It was worse than that because when we started analysing all the air inside these incubators, it was all contaminated with bacteria too numerous to count bacteria because the locals were filling up the water reservoirs with the only water they had, which was tap water or river water, which was contaminated with E. coli and all sorts of things. So in a few hours, too numerous to count bacteria. We were killing kids, actually putting them into these incubators. And nobody was trying to fix this, so we had to have a crack at that. I think there's a, a little video clip that can show of the incubator that we've, um, we've invented, which cost $2,000 versus... Uh, just cut the sound. Uh, $2,000 for this device versus $40,000 for a conventional incubator. And it's like all the things that we do, we try and make it sexy, because <laughs> sexy, sex, I like sexy things. Um, and um, that's in production right now and coming off the production line in uh, January 2016. Everyone that we get out there will save 500 kids' lives. So it can have a real global impact by getting this kind of technology out to the world. But what about New Zealanders? How do New Zealanders track on the world stage in terms of getting technology out there? I was fortunate because when I came to New Zealand, I understood what made New Zealanders tick. Generally, you, you really don't understand it because when you are born here, you just accept things. The Kiwis are not right, you know. <laughs> They've got certain characteristics which set them apart from the rest of the world. First one is they're not fond of rules. They don't like rules. I mean, if I ask, I mean, thankfully the camera's not going that way, but if I ask all those guys who've got an illegitimate extension to their house or a window which hasn't got a building permit, the whole, everybody would put their hands up. Because we're not fond of rules. And a good example of how that can manifest into something truly brilliant is, who's heard of Peter Beck? Anybody heard of Peter Beck? Okay. Otherwise known as Rocket Man. Now, he used to put rockets on his bike to get his bike to go to school faster. And about eight years ago, he went down to Haraki Golf with a bit of funding from Michael Fay and put a rocket up into the atmosphere. This was a prelude to putting, deploying um, satellites around 
in, 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 in the orbit so that they can be used for telecommunications. So that was his first try. Can't do that in America. Get locked up. The FBI would be brand new place with tracker dogs. Can't do that in Australia because the air traffic controllers want to know where it's going to land. We've no bloody idea where it landed. Because <laughs> that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. He just wanted to see how far he could get out. And he did it again. <laughs> and now he's got a business called Rocket Lab Industries, which has $180 million investment. In fact, Rocket Lab has more scientists uh, in New Zealand. We have now more scientists per head of population than any other country in the world. And that's because he basically could do it because there's no regulations to stop us from doing a whole lot of stuff. In other countries, there are all sorts of obstacles, but there aren't in New Zealand. So that's the first thing that makes a difference. The next one is that we've got no respect for the status quo. <laughs> Absolutely no respect for it. We, if somebody says invent something, we will. Pretty much, we'll give it a crack. Doesn't matter what it is. Nuclear, fission, whatever. Um, and that leads me on to people like Bill Buckley. Who's heard of Bill Buckley? Okay, probably only one or two percent. This is what's really wrong with New Zealand is everybody in this room has been touched by Bill Buckley because he makes 90% of the electromagnets that fire up the chips for all of the flat screen TVs and all of the displays in these devices. It's not a company in Silicon Valley. It's a guy in South Auckland with Buckley Engineering. And he's changed the world because somebody came to him and said, look, these normal electromagnet machines the size of a suitcase they take are, you know, probably about a week to process 10,000 chips. He, here's a half the size of this room. And he just said, I'll build one of those. And he did. So Bill, good old Bill, he had no respect for the status quo and he changed the way that things happen. The other thing that makes us different is that we dare to dream. This is the only country in the world you can dream to be anything that you want to be. And I look at these young faces uh, in the audience and I think if you chose to want to be Prime Minister, and you join the Labour Party or the National Party, you could. You can't do that in America and you can't do that in the UK. There's all these embedded systems. But in New Zealand, you can be anything that you choose to be. So the trick for us is to really understand what New Zealand's about in terms of the opportunities that we have. And I do a lot of talks to schools because I want everybody here to be touched by the fact that you know, when I was um, born in England, I was brought up under a railway bridge, or I, or I was in an orphanage, ran away, lived in a, uh, under a railway bridge. And my first dream in my life was to own my own bicycle shop. But ever after that, I had a 10-year dream. And the 10-year dream that I've got for the last part of my life is to change the world. And why we talk to groups like this is inevitably somebody in that group says, I want to help or I want to change the world too. And that's what our team does. We have no respect for the status quo, and we get on and think about how we can use innovation. I love innovation because you can think about this. I love this one story, which is really cool, which is about a, uh, an Indian was sitting next to, a South American Indian was sitting next to this stream, and he cut his leg, and it started to get infected. And he got this frog, and he rubbed it on the side of his leg, and it fixed it. Because in that frog, it's got a very powerful penicillinase. Because you might imagine that frog gets cut a lot when it's just diving around. So nature gave it this penicillinase cold coating, which is also waterproof. So the Indians now use this as a, a way of fixing all their wounds. God knows how many animals he went through before that worked. <laughs> that frog was no, that frog was good, but that turtle. <laughs> <laughs> but what makes us different is that we do also have time to think about things. When you look at our productivity. Um, in terms of other countries, it doesn't look too crash hot. Because if you live in Tarangu, you know you never get anybody after four o'clock on a Friday. You know? <laughs> but that gives you time to think. And you need time to think. And if you're observant and you think and put those things together with a team of people who believe in your idea, then you can indeed change the world. One of the things that characterises us in the whole world and separates us from the rest of the world is that we have no respect for the status quo. We're not fond of rules. We invent things and products and technologies that go out into the world. Right now, there are a billion people, or more right now, at this very moment, using Kiwi technology. Um, there's a guy called Colin Murdoch. Who's heard of Colin Murdoch? He invented the plastic disposable hypodermic syringe, which changed global healthcare for everybody. It wasn't a multinational medical device company in America. It was a pharmacist from Timaru 
who change the world. So right now in the world, there's a billion people either using a flat screen TV, a boat, um, uh, which is uh, jet propelled bulk boats, or it might be somebody using spreadable butter, or even the mechanism that shoots um, paintballs was invented by a Kiwi. And of course, they're probably watching a movie using technology that was invented by people at workshops. And that's what makes us different. We've got no respect for the status quo. We invent things to propel the human race forwards. I'm ferociously proud to be a Kiwi, and I hope that you guys are too. Thank you very much.